Majoring in philosophy, is it a death sentence for your career? Let's ask some of my former students. I'm Christopher Annadale, and this is Life After Philosophy. Welcome to Life After Philosophy. My guest today is Daniel Scully, a 2018 graduate of Mount St. Mary's University with a BA in philosophy. He earned his JD at Fordham University School of Law in 2023 and is now a prosecutor at the Queens County District Attorney's Office in New York City. Dan, welcome to the program. Hi, Dr. Annadale. Thanks so much for having me. Well, the theme of the podcast is the the use that liberal arts grads and philosophy grads are making of their degree later in life. And uh, maybe you could begin by telling us something about the path that's taken you from being a philosophy graduate six years ago to being to working in uh, in the prosecutor's office today. How did how did that go for you? It went well. I you know I I do believe that uh, philosophy is one of those. Um, unique uh, fields of study where you're not so much studying philosophy for the sake of um, some sort of practical advantage or something like that. I think uh, for a lot of philosophy graduates could kind of agree that it's, it's something that um, is just within you that calls you to, to go on to that sort of path. I remember from a very young age on, I was probably about 14 or so, I couldn't sleep at night in high school, just always wondering about the big questions and things like that. You know, who are we? Why are we here? Where are we meant to go? Is there a God? Things like that. What is the meaning of life? And um, I, I had a class my senior year of, of high school that was all about Plato, Aristotle, and Thomas Aquinas. And it really took hold of me and my entire being. And uh, I remember going down to Mount St. Mary's University and just doing the orientation down there. And I just had such a um, such a firm calling that this is where I'm I'm meant to go. I'm meant to be. And I had the the four most wonderful years of my life studying philosophy at Mount St. Mary's. And um, afterwards, I, I took two years off really to discern whether seminary was my calling or law was my calling, or even continued, you know, further uh, education in, in philosophy. And um, aside from any sort of practical use it may give me, the study of philosophy in college um, really just uh, al allowed me to live the life um, that uh, I do believe I'm called to live. And it, the study of philosophy in college allowed me to understand what I believe is, is the purpose in life and, and how I should live my life. And uh, from there, it, it just really propelled me into where I believe my calling is now into the world of prosecution, um, pursuing after justice that, you know, Plato likes to talk about in, in uh, Gorgias. And um, just uh, I, I find, for instance, in my prosecutorial work, just so much day-to-day -day meaning in the stuff that I do. And it, it really was the philosophical studies that gave me that grounding as to, you know, whether there is meaning in life and, and how I can find it and pursuing after it. And uh, now I live my life on a day-to-day -day basis, full of meaning, and it really is uh, very fulfilling. It sounds like philosophy education just sort of resonated with you from who you were from from a young age, right? So uh, it's almost like, you know, this is the sort of thing you were you were made for. Is that is that the feeling that has grown stronger as you've gone in the years past graduation? Yes, absolutely. But I, I do think that um, I'm not sure if maybe I speak to other philosophy majors in the same way as, as I view this, but the more and more into life that you get, I mean, it, your mind just almost never shuts off, I think, after studying philosophy. And um, I guess the mind was never shut off to begin with. But so you just always constantly question, at least in my mind, what is the ultimate meaning then? And, and what, it, what am I ultimately called to do? And you see each, each step along the way is like a, a stepping stone towards, towards what you have to do. It's, 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 it is a constant struggle for me. Did I make the right call? Am I really on the right path towards my meaning? So it, it's, it's a little bit difficult in that aspect, having been a philosophy major and wondering, um, you know, where, where do I go from here? Am I on the right path? What, what, what is my ultimate calling in life? So. 
you spoke a moment ago about finding meaning in the work that you do in the prosecutor's office without getting into cases. What What is the day-to-day -day work of a sort of junior prosecutor in your office like? And, and how do you see that being an extension of, of where you've come so far? Yeah, so a, a lot of it is um, where I am right now is called the Intake Bureau. So after a person gets arrested um, and all the paperwork is sent to the police officers, uh, I mean, the police officers do all the paperwork, they send it over to the DA's office. And then that's where we start to process things and we write up the affidavit. Um, half of half of the people from my class who started at the DA's office are in that sort of position. And then the other half are in uh, criminal court land that, that deals with a lot of misdemeanors, mostly like DWIs, DUIs, things like that, assaults and stuff. And um, it is disheartening to know that specifically in Queens County, there's such a high rate of dismissal. So many of these cases that, you know, really do deserve uh, justice. Uh, justice is just never given. We, we are dealing though, you know, in the grand scheme of everything with, with rather low level crimes and, and justice at a very low level. But it, it does, uh, it, it, it's good practice. It, it's necessary practice for what you need going forward for when you do handle those things that, that do require greater justice. But how, how that intertwines though too with my background in philosophy is, you see, for instance, all these things, and, and you do find so much meaning in maybe some of the most simple matters, because um, I think principally, at least something that I was able to take away from philosophy is that, you know, there's, there's no sliding scale when it comes to justice, really. Justice is applicable at every level, and it doesn't mean, for instance, that only the highest level of cases, those that are attempted murders or murders or things like that, deserve justice, but it also means if somebody gets their you know, $500 bike stolen from, from the uh, street that's been locked up. And it's, it's hard to tangle with the idea that somebody like that might just get away. And it does instill because of your understanding of justice and your understanding of the meaning that you have in your work, it does instill a sort of passion in you to make sure that uh, you're doing all that you can to, to make sure that justice is met at, at every level. Has it been kind of a come down to go from the sort of philosophical ideas of justice, thinking of sort of, you know, Plato's ideals and forms down into the sort of gritty day to day, high dismissal rate uh, work of actually trying to bring justice to individuals and, and communities where you're at? Uh, you know, it, it's funny. The I was in court last night until about like two in the morning. And uh, I was I was thinking about how like theory and practice intertwine so much. And um, we're sitting there in court and, and all the while I'm just observing as this um, one rather high level case is going by, there's a parole officer there speaking on the record and then another assistant district attorney is there. And they're, they're both arguing theory basically what this case is about. And um, when all the while, all the while, the you know we're we're talking in in theory about what law is and what um, what is right, what is according to the law, and even what may not be according to law, but what what we do believe is commonsensical, which is one thing that they teach you in law school, is that you know the the point of courts and courts are ought to be meant to be commonsensical, and all the while you have though the facts before you of a particular case and the defendant there, so you have two people speaking both in theory and in practice. And, um, you know, in, in one side, too, or really in all sides, everyone's talking about the complaining witness or the complaining victim who's just not present in their, in their wants and their needs. And the defendant is there before the court. And, the, um, you know, there's a great intertwining between theory and practice there. And it, it really uh, sometimes comes with great contention, sometimes comes with great ease. Sometimes you have, for instance, um, you know, this uh, complaining victim who does not want to move forward in, say, a domestic violence case. But, uh, you know, given the circumstances that according to law and according to what you know is right or wrong, that uh, the defendant is, you know, guilty of these charges and, and that, you know, justice definitely requires some sort of uh, consequence uh, for the defendant. But unfortunately, it's just not practical. And sometimes you are left uh, feeling unfulfilled in the sense that, Oh, well, that's that's a shame as as well as the theory and the law may have worked. 
because of some sort of practical obstacle, we're not able to reach justice in this particular instance. What do you think about the idea that that the courts and the whole justice system is itself a kind of political institution? And so it, it takes part in and maybe reflects the political unity or disunity of the people. I don't know if this is too too abstract or or too thinky a question, but does that does that come up as well in addition to trying to do the practical work that you're referring to? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. The the way that I ended up going to the DA's office is because somebody high up in the office actually was also uh, found himself in, in the DA's office because he has such a uh, firm faith and he was led this path, he believes, through Christian apologetics and stuff. And very quickly, the two of us found each other with, with a lot of mutual ground there. And we both do believe that we're in there every day doing God's work, essentially, and that our, our, our work is so meaningful and it is so right. And, um, you know, that there is so much purpose in the work that we do, but that definitely goes without saying that there are quite, quite many people in the office where, for instance, this is a good job if you want to be a litigator or anything like that, or if you want to go into politics. And uh, I would say that many people surely go into it for political purposes without really seeing any of it as truly meaningful or anything like that. The office also has a great camaraderie where, you know, separate from from any sort of purpose or meaning that one may find, there are a lot of there are a lot of different factors, including camaraderie, political purposes, things like that, that do make it hard for people to leave the office. That they do enjoy the work, but there definitely is this um, contention that you see sometimes between certain figures working in the office, between their political aspirations and what the people really want and what what justice requires that the people have. So th there definitely is that contention, but I, I do think that there is that contention on, on both sides of the aisle, both in prosecution and both in, in, and in defense work. But it does make things hard. For instance, I would imagine like if, a, if you had a world where everyone did look at it uh, for philosophical purposes and, and because they're doing the work, because they find so much meaning and purpose in it, that you really wouldn't have so much uh, contention with with the work that we're doing and what the people want and what the people deserve and uh, what justice requires. Let me take you back a couple of years to law school because one of the previous people I interviewed on this podcast was also an attorney and she spoke a little bit about the way that she thought the Socratic method that she learned in philosophy classes helped her in law school. What was your experience of law school like as a philosophy grad? Did you feel like it was was that you were better prepared for it or some parts of it were easier or more challenging or more the focus of your attention because of how you'd been prepared? I think, um, well, I, I will say just at base that uh, my philosophical background really gave me appreciation for a great many things. And, and one of those things being the appreciation of like human reason in law, uh, as, aside from what I'll, I'll go on, I will say that I had, um, it was taught by Professor Michael Bauer from Fordham undergrad who teaches at a master's program there as well. He taught a, um, a class that I had on natural law and reasoning for, uh, with Thomas Aquinas and that was in law school and that was just wonderful. But, um, and that also showed the intertwining though between human reason and the creation of human law and, um, and what could be divinely inspired and things like that. And, and I will say that from the get-go, once we started reading texts on how, say, property laws developed or, or how any of that, uh, you know, any, any, even, even just civil procedures developed, it really um, makes you appreciate, for instance, uh, I think aside from other students who are, aren't coming from philosophical backgrounds, makes you really appreciate like, oh, I could understand why this sort of law was created. Whereas for a lot of law students, for instance, you may be just trying to memorize what law is. Whereas I think with, with those who do have philosophical backgrounds, that they, they understand and can appreciate, okay, I, I could understand why law was developed among a group of men during this time, you know, to become this, this way. And uh, it, it's, it's great and fascinating in those ways. And in those aspects, it, it does in a way 
make it easier for you to to really grasp the law or or whatever because it seems like you might have a greater understanding of it the the socratic method itself going back and forth i, I think is i think I, it, it definitely it's, it's hard for me to say because i didn't experience law school without that sort of background but having experienced law school with that sort of philosophical background i do believe that it did make many things much easier in terms of being able to answer questions in class and being able to read in a way that would prepare you to answer certain questions in class or, or, or help you even to anticipate certain questions that might be asked down the road, given the text. Whereas I do remember in the beginning, it, it, it definitely is a uh, learning curve and a bit of a struggle for some people, say, maybe without that sort of background to be able to anticipate certain questions that may be asked about some readings and stuff and um, to be able to answer those questions well. How do you see your work and your identity sort of as a prosecutor in relation to some of the larger ethical criticisms or observations that are made about the criminal justice system as a whole or even about specific elements of the system? Does working within the system give you a feeling that you are you're actively trying to improve it or respond to those criticisms? Or do you feel that that um, people are often criticizing the, the CJ system from, from the outside without fully understanding it. Where, where, where do you sort of stand in relation to some, some of the things that are commonly said? Um, yeah, I think it, it, a lot of the time it really does depend on who it's coming from. One thing that I learned in law school is, uh, you know, um, so many people will have these uh, ideas and beliefs about certain things in the, in the workings of certain functions or whatever based on their, um, their, their underpinning or underlying philosophical beliefs. And uh, not, so, not so much um, will lend, for instance, uh, some sort of uh, level of reasonability that I think is required in understanding the situation. Like, for instance, it, I, I do know a great number of people that are in the criminal justice system that um, or, or defense attorneys where their basic philosophical understanding is, is ultimately we shouldn't have jails and things like that. And if it were up to them, all, all jails would be open and no one would be in jail. And uh, to a point, it just, it becomes, it becomes impractical to in any way sort of respond to that person. And then, it, you know, you, I go in every day and I try to do the best job that I possibly can. I try to do what justice requires for me to do. You see it even on the prosecutorial level though too, because you know, to a certain degree, you know, some people may want to push, say, towards one way and trying to prosecute a case, whereas uh, maybe justice requires that we don't prosecute a case in that aspect, just because of that reason alone, regardless of your, you know, philosophical beliefs or anything like that. It's, it's though, it, it's, I definitely don't work in order to respond to critics and things like that. I definitely do what I can in order to try to um, if there is disagreement or somebody it does say highly criticize the sort of work that I do, I'll try my best to have like a conversation with them. I, I guess the best way that I, I could really just respond to any of that at all is, is really though just going into the office and doing the best job that I can each day in, in hopes that things will change for the better and that maybe people will realize good things about it. And, um, and where we do have our failings to to be sure that they do uh, point that out so that we can fix them as well. Do you think that if people could see more closely and directly the work that you and your team do in your office, that their general opinion of the system would improve? Yeah, I, I, th I think absolutely. I, I, I def even aside from just general opinion of, of the work, I think um, just the, the workings of, of um the way that uh, the office operates would even change. I remember I, in law school, I always had this idea of what uh, being a prosecutor meant until I took a clinic my last year in law school, where it was just a year long where I had hands-on experience of prosecutorial work. And I had some incredibly inspiring lectures and, and just experiences that really made me appreciate the understanding of, uh, and uh, appreciate and understand the, um, the great, work that is done at a DA's office and how difficult it may be. But 
there is, for instance, I, I, I do think if, if more people worked in the office, we would, there would be better opinions, I do believe, of, of the office and, and the workings of the office and similar um, functions like that much better. But also, I, I do think that certain laws and stuff would change too. Uh, right now in, in New York, we are so, uh, the laws are just so pro defense, which is uh, in large part, you know, do, uh, I mean, in, in, in large part is the reason as to why we have so many cases that are being dismissed and uh, things like that. It just, the discovery reform and the bail reform laws have been so anti prosecution. And, um, you know, it's all like a pendulum, though, I guess, it, because the majority opinion of the office was different years ago. There were laws then where everything was just so pro prosecution. But I, I do I do agree, though, that if uh, if more people had uh, more exposure, like hands on experience to the work that we actually do, I do think both opinion and, and laws and, and of those things and appreciation for the office would would change in, in general. A little while ago, you talked about uh, taking some time out to discern and to think clearly and to sort of grow in confidence about the path that you're on. Was there a particular time or event or sort of watershed that you passed by where you realized, you know, this this really is the path for me. This is how I'm serving the world and and serving God now. I rather hard question. To answer, I'm, I'm not sure that there was ever, for instance, there like a particular moment where I was just like, yes, this is what I must do. This is what I must do going forward. Whereas like, I remember uh, just sitting in that senior honors theology class that I was talking to you about earlier. I mean, I rem when we first picked up Plato's Mino and we read through the whole book, I was just so, that was my whole being was just, you know, uh, taken a hold of and just like, yes, this is this is what I must do. I must study this. I must go forward with this all leading up until when I went to Mount St. Mary's, just that first visit and meeting with a few of the philosophy professors there at the time. And uh, it just, in my whole being was just grasped like, and this is what I must do. This is where I must go. And I had um, through my studies, I had, I had thought about a couple different things as to what to do. And I, um, for me personally, a lot of it came down to practical things actually, unlike some others, joining the seminary would have been against really the wishes of like my family at the time. So uh, I had to take that into consideration. And then I uh, just had to take into consideration too, just some other things of, of staying close to home and stuff or, or any of that. And I'm not sure that there was an exact moment, but I, I do believe though that, that God gave me some options and was um, basically like choose I'm not sure if, if ultimately like maybe he gave me some time on my own and was like okay well you choose the path I'll help guide you along perhaps any of maybe the three or so paths are are meant to lead me ultimately all along the way but maybe it is just for right now a little bit of of um, God saying well let me uh, allow you to choose what what you want for right now not really sure is this whole uh this whole divine plan, but yeah, I, I haven't felt that since Mount St. Mary's really, although it definitely uh, goes without saying though, that uh, I definitely do feel certain moments along the way, like when you're just struck by God's beauty and all. And sometimes when you do feel like, wow, I am doing what he wants me to do, not necessarily like say career wise or having gone to law school or whatever, maybe, but just it's hard to explain, but I, I didn't feel that that exact same sort of um, calling the same way that I felt for law and for the legal industry that I felt like for um, college or, or the study of philosophy. Are there certain ways you're aware of that your philosophy background affects the kind of work you're able to do now in the prosecutor's office? I mean, sort of there being you, Dan, there as the guy he is with the background he has versus somebody else with a totally different background. What do you think you bring to the, to the team and to the work? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I, I do think aside from what I mentioned earlier about how, you know, it is a good job for people um, who want to litigate and things like that, or who have political aspirations or anything like that. 
I think even those people to some level, and, and the, I would say the large majority of the office definitely find some meaning and purpose in the work. The way that my philosophical background definitely affects the way that I work in there is I find just total meaning and, and, and so much purpose in that work. And I really do believe that you're, uh, you know, pursuing after justice is really doing God's work. So for instance, I think the more sort of like-minded people like, uh, like that to have in the office, the better really, because uh, it's, it really is that every, every case is just not a case. It really is a situation that on some, some very low level uh, at, at least requires some sort of justice. And I really do believe that, you know, justice cannot be done um, without sort of some sort of grounding and, and ultimate meaning and ultimate justice and things like that. So uh, to, to be there and to be vocal about it and to reemphasize the point that, look, we're not just, you know, doing law, we're not just trying to put people in jail or take people out of jail, but, but that these, these matters, um, these cases really matter. And that, um, that it, it really means a lot on the very meta level as to the work that we're doing. It definitely, definitely brings that into the office and, and I think creates just a better environment for everyone around both those that we're prosecuting and those that we're trying to help and, and um, for everyone else doing the work. That's great. That's a great perspective. I really appreciate that. The final question of the show is usually about advice that you would offer to people who were thinking about taking more philosophy classes, majoring in philosophy, not knowing quite where it would take them. I know you said that you were your attachment to philosophy started back in high school before you came to college. But thinking back to a time in your life where you weren't sort of animated by it or you were a little bit less certain about whether it would be a worthwhile pursuit, what do you think you could say to someone who felt that they were in that situation now and, and is listening to you from your perspective now in 2024? Yeah. So I will say I never had that with philosophy just because, um, you know, it, I, I never had any sort of like vacillation or wavering as to my study of it. I was just so in love with it. And I s still think about it every day. And I wish I had the opportunity more to read. And if I was uh, well off and didn't have to worry about doing uh, work on a day to day basis for money, I'd love to be in a philosophy PhD program somewhere. But, um, you know, I, w I will, though, try to speak to those sorts of people through my experience through law school, because my experience in law school, I had a pretty difficult um, time my first year because the one thing that I realized in law that was so disheartening to me was that, you know, the study of law, unlike the study of philosophy, the end of the study of law is argumentation, whereas the end of the study of philosophy is truth. And I, I realized pretty quickly on in law school that I'm actually, I'm not in love with, um, I'm not in love with with the end of study of, of argumentation, I'm really in love with the end of study of truth and uh, what in, in trying to figure out what is true, what is not true. But I understood that studying law, you know, has definitely some practical consequences in, um, you know, this world and, and the ability to make money or, or just progress at some level in, in this world. And, and to me on many different levels too, it's it, I, having studied law and getting a job in the legal industry was necessary at a point. And I continued studying on knowing that, okay, well, this is uh, something that is at least on some level interesting, but is also something at some level practical and uh, that there is great value in having this. I, I think for those in philosophy, it's um, in wondering as to whether they should continue in their career, it's very much the same um, that it just just remember that even if you don't find the beauty in, for instance, the way that I didn't find beauty in, in say, studying after the end of argumentation, perhaps people don't find the beauty in studying and after the end of truth. Just to understand that that there is great value in it, that there is great practical use in it. I mean, also another end of philosophy is to enable you to think well, and we are all thinking things. And uh, the power of the mind and to be able to think well, even in an age of AI or anything like that, is just um, 
an extremely important asset, especially now when I think in the future, we're going to see a, a generation of people probably coming up that uh, don't have that sort of humanity background and, and aren't able to think so well. And uh, it will become a great you know, uh, asset of practical use in the world. So even aside from, from even the, finding the beauty and the, theore- the theory aspect of it, just to know that there is such great practical aspect to it too, and there's so much practical value and to hang in there. And who knows also, uh, I think also very much like um, the, uh, the area of law when I was studying in, in law school, I was so disheartened in a lot of ways by a bunch of different things because so many aspects of law seem to be just for the sake of argumentation, just to win cases, to win money, things like that. It wasn't really until my third year of law school after just coming on a very disheartening internship at a uh, family law firm that I realized, wow, there actually is this area in law that I do have so much passion for and so much meaning for, and that is the criminal justice uh, system, I would have never guessed that. So even for those wavering and and like um, back and forth in in their philosophical studies, you know, just continue on because very much like law, there are many different areas of philosophy where, you you know, philosophy of science, philosophy of logic or any of that, where you, um, there is so much to study that aside from even just understanding the practical value and use and all that, that you know, you may stumble across an area that uh, maybe two or three years into your your studies that that you may really fall in love with and may really help shape um, your your life and, and allow you to have, find meaning and purpose in, in your day to day life, even after studying philosophy. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Dan. I really appreciate that. My guest today has been Daniel Scully of the Queens County District Attorney's Office in New York City. Dan, thanks very much for being on the show today. Thanks so much, Dr. Anadol. Thank you for listening to Life After Philosophy. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate it five stars and share this episode with a friend. I appreciate your support.